Hello, everybody. Welcome to the, I can say, official first episode of Behind Erasmus, the show where we talk about the people behind Erasmus. Today, I have my my roommate, my flatmate, he's been both, my great friend, Matthew, the man with many names. Would you mind introducing yourself? Hello. <laughs> so, my name is Matthew. That's the English version. In Greek, we say Matthäus. But um, just to be easier for people to understand and to say, I just say the English version, I just say Matthew. So, yeah, I'm from Greece. Uh, I almost, I'm also graduated from a social work university, social worker, youth worker, last three years, let's say. And uh, yeah, I'm here in Krakow now for my European Solidarity Corps, uh, volunteering, and I'm doing great. That's all. Ah, awesome. Spoko. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Matthew, uh, that I know you have like a lot of experiences uh, in Erasmus, in projects, and if I remember right, you even uh, wrote so one now, right? Yeah, uh, so I started, um, just to take the summary from the whole thing, how it started, uh, it was just a day in my home in Athens, and I was just uh, sitting on my laptop, and I suddenly saw a notification uh, on the Facebook group we have with my university, like all the like tutors and professors and also the students together. And one professor was like, hey, we need a, a guy or girl for a project Erasmus Plus in Germany. And I was like, why not? So I just applied and they just took me and I went for the first time. It was first time abroad and first time in Erasmus Plus. So I was in Berlin for first, the first time for, uh, participating in an Erasmus project. And after that, I just got in love with Erasmus Plus projects and I just kept on traveling and going to different Erasmus projects, training courses, seminars, youth exchanges, all the categories uh, for two years and something till last year that I decided to go one step further. So I actually uh, applied for my internship with my university to do, do it abroad. In the organization, I, well, I was in Berlin the first time I traveled. So it's actually kind of a more emotional, like a romantic perspective of choosing this place. And I also trust the people that work there. They do a great job. And it was like super, um, I was super ambitious for that. You know, I wouldn't take the best of the experience out of it. And uh, after that, I came back to Athens. I continue participating in Erasmus projects. And uh, here I am now in Europe for Youth, uh, in Krakow. And uh, that's why we met, actually. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's the story. Also, uh, I've been like a participant. Uh, I'm also a youth leader in youth exchanges with uh, part participants under 18. It's like 13 to 17 with city bound network. Um, and I'm youth leader for the Greek group, usually. I've been also youth leader for the German group. And uh, also I've been like leader for adults in youth exchanges, in group of adults. Uh, also participant, as I already mentioned. And uh, yeah, so kind of professionally doing that right now. And oh, that's all sorry. I think, yeah. I know it's good, you're even doing my job here. You're like segue to the beginning of your journey. <laughs> it's weird, <laughs> I just like to sit here and let you, you do the thing. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Uh, so your first... Um, contact with Erasmus was uh, through university. It was like a, a youth exchange training course or something? It uh, was a training course. So somehow it was really into like uh, more serious stuff, let's say, because youth training courses and seminars are like more structured with a specific aim, like uh, learning outcomes, specific, specific methodologies and methods and tools to use. So it's not just a topic that you leave participants to discover by interacting with each other and, you know, more like chilled way, let's say. It's more like uh, activities, things to learn, things to do. And it was actually the first training I had to be a youth leader. So I actually learned the methodology about uh, adventure-based learning, about uh, Tickman's model, uh, about group dynamics. Uh, it was also about uh, learning zone, like uh, comfort zone and panic zone, all these kind of things. And yeah, it was like a training course and it was super amazing. But after that, I had this kind of experience from Erasmus in youth exchanges that it was super chill, like uh, doing some activities, uh, having some time. Like it was kind of like, wow, what is happening here? Yeah. But that came later, actually. Uh, but in between, I was just already like in love with Erasmus stuff like that. And 
a big thanks to this professor that he uploaded this uh, application uh, if he ever see this video so yeah. <laughs> for sure he's going to see it but uh b before you had this first experience have you like heard bef uh, before about erasmus you like had an idea what it was uh i had uh, only about erasmus studies uh, because I had some friends that they were saying that they want to go and live in a different city to do their semester there. And it was just that. And uh, I, I, could, I cannot say that I thought about it as well, because for me it sounded a really big step to do it. You know, I was like, I don't know, like different country, my English are not the best at the moment. It, like, it was just, you know, I could like comprehend and understand what I was reading or what I was listening to. But uh, not in the level I do it right now, after all these youth exchanges and like meeting people from other countries and interacting with them. About speaking, it was nothing. I was just like, I don't know, like I couldn't speak. I was thinking the sentence I wanted to say, like five minutes to just form the way I'm going to say it to be correct. And uh, so, yeah, I just all these years, my English went from, let's say, two or 3.6. Not great, not terrible. They went to... I don't know, like it's the to, great, to uh, uh, English short guys complimenting you on your English and asking <laughs> if you're for England. <laughs> so, so yeah, it was just uh, Erasmus studies and um, what else? Um, sorry, it was only Erasmus studies and uh, that's all. I never heard about Erasmus projects and stuff like that. So first time in Berlin when I was there, I was like, oh, what is that? Like, what do we do here? And I arrived the first day, I saw people gathering like on the circle, you know, like on the <laughs> church and starting saying our names. And I was like, yeah, OK, what's the purpose? Why we do that? But at the end of the like, la I remember last night at the farewell party we had, I was just crying. Like I was just I don't want to live like it from this place. It was so amazing. Yeah, I think it's like this for, for everyone. The, the first day you think it's like something alcoholic anonymous, everyone sitting in a circle, telling their name, their story. <laughs> and the last day everyone is sucking and crying. Yeah, but, uh, was... Before you went, you had like any, um, let's say, any uh, pre pre ideas of what it was like, uh, if you had any fears or misconceptions. Because, for example, the the first time uh, I heard about Erasmus, I was in the Pirate District and there was like a bar called Erasmus, and mm -hmm. there was a lot of foreigners in there. And I thought, oh, Erasmus just uh, young people traveling to go to different cities and, and then party and stuff and like that. So I, I had the, I always had that this yeah. stigma on me. You had something like that. Um... Not really. I I was actually like, we had this kind of students from different countries in my university. Uh, but uh, the thing was that my, uh, let's say my apartment of the university, like my studies about social work, is just a subcategory of the university. So it's like the University of West Attica. And you have these subcategories of like, uh, let's say professions and directions you want to choose. So my apartment was totally like in another place from the Central University because of space management and some renovations and I don't know. So all my study years were like in just an, a building in the middle of nowhere with no other students around, just my like co-students and uh, classmates and just that. But we had this kind of uh, Erasmus students from different uh, places. So I knew how actually what it is actually. Uh, and about the pubs, we had actually this kind of, let's say, uh, business thinking. So it was in this place that there is a university, like a few minutes further, let's say, there is a big road uh, with uh, traditional Greek taverns on the right, on the left hand. So it's just a big street and you can sit wherever you want and you just choose, I don't know, like based on the people, I guess, or <laughs> what is empty, it's super crowded, full of students, it's a super nice place. And every time there was a rival for Erasmus students from different universities, every tavern were putting this kind of, like, say, panels and saying, welcome Erasmus, Erasmus party here and stuff like that. <laughs> so, yeah, every year I we knew that on, for example, September, October or like in the summertime uh, in uh, March or April, you're going to have, the, for example, this kind of... Uh, uh, Erasmus students and Erasmus parties. So we were actually going to these places just to see Erasmus students and probably they were, you know, getting drunk with Greek Uzo or, uh, I don't know, like Cipro, this kind of Greek drinks. Uh, so yeah, I had this kind of 
impression also in my mind that okay you just go for Erasmus and you're actually partying in a different city uh, and you say that you're studying at the same time <laughs> something like that uh, but after I got more into the details and I saw what is, like, how it is actually working so yeah it just changed my mind I'm, I mean it didn't change my mind actually I mean it's happening you can party during your Erasmus you can meet people you can go for a beer you can do your stuff of course but at the same time, there is another like side of this, which is the learning part, and it's also important. And it's something that most people don't realize because they don't see that. You know, it's like I'm not gonna go with my book in Krakow and start reading and saying, "Ah, oh, you see, I'm on Erasmus, I'm studying." For example, you know, you just live your life normally as you do in your hometown. That's a thing. That's great. So, so it's good that you have like the both sides of the perspective. You were like hosting uh, Erasmus, and then you went abroad. And, uh, and how was uh, your time abroad uh, with Erasmus in the, the one in Germany? So uh, it was my first time living by myself. <clears throat> so uh, I was studying in my home city in Athens, basically. And I was living with my parents all these years because there was no need to move and go to a different city to study. So when I took the decision to move in Berlin, it was actually the first time for me living alone and uh, living abroad also. So it was two things in one. Um, the experience in the office was amazing. I learned a lot of stuff. We had a lot of youth exchanges, uh, nice times before coronavirus. <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of youth exchanges, a lot of uh, training courses. I started getting on the other side of the, um, of the youth exchanges of the project, basically because I was facilitating uh, activities, explaining. So I was kind of like a trainee trainer there. Let's say I took definitely a lot of stuff. I learned a lot of stuff, uh, facilitating skills exp to explain and be precise and be clear to what you're going to say. So you're actually transferring the information you want in a really good way and both three ways, like, I mean, formally, informally and non-formally, all these kind of ways. Uh, so it was great. Berlin is an amazing city, big city, huge city, like in comparison with Athens, at least it's super huge like um so it was kind of let's say uh perfect from the perspective of erasmus and what i did there and it was super great but at the same time living there was nice but lonely at the same time because like it's a huge city people are not engaging relationships so easily so it's actually you know big distances also for example i was I was traveling for one hour to go to the office for example from the place i was living and i was still inside berlin not outside yeah, it's really really huge so yeah uh, but it's a beautiful city a lot of stuff to do a lot of things to see and it's great for projects for Erasmus projects because you just have city games and people can see everything and also with multicultural city full of Erasmus students people living there from different countries uh what else yeah the good thing also with uh, the office was uh, the location so uh, having a like internship there was actually how to say it, living in a huge city but working inside the forest because the office is exactly inside the forest in um, FFA that's the name of the organization and they have a great facilities and great things to do while the projects for example they have this kind of um, do you know this um, how we call it higher up course this kind of uh, game so when you climb the tree and you have this kind of task to cross from one tree to the other Oh. Or, for example, we had to build our own crafts. Let's say, like, we had this kind of barrels, wood, uh, wooden sticks, and we had to tie them and make our own craft and just to make it float in the lake, like on the lake. I don't know, it's like so many th thoughts like I have about this place and so many experiences and memories. It's super great. And definitely something I would never regret, being in Berlin and doing my traineeship there and meeting all these people I met and cooperated with. So, yeah. And no, sorry. And because of Berlin, of course, I'm here right now. Like, if I haven't met these people I met there and continue cooperating and meeting them in projects and having this kind of cooperation, I wouldn't be here right now, probably. So, yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's great. And how much time uh, you were in uh, Berlin? I was six months there. Uh, during the winter, I went in October and I left in March, uh, like last day of March. Okay, and before you went, you had like any expectations or like fears? Um, 
So, uh, most of the fears I had were um, about living alone and living abroad. And uh, not about the office. Uh, I was pretty sure that in the office I would have things to do and they would have a kind of uh, task management that they're going to like um, say to me, for example, to do some stuff and give me responsibilities. And I was totally sure for that. And it happened and so my expectations were fulfilled and I wasn't disappointed. But the fears I had at the same time about living alone and living abroad were like became true because actually it was I was struggling with like routine and how to do things and you know um, I wasn't speaking German also which was kind of like a um, let's say obstacle for my everyday thing yeah. because I want you know so yeah about the Erasmus though uh, no nothing bad I would like like to say or mention everything was fine I did stuff I learned stuff we wrote projects uh, like we had one basically not projects project we wrote one uh, with two friends of mine from the office it got approved but I wasn't there unfortunately because I had exams with my university um, it was just great I don't know like um, I'm 100% thumbs up and totally yeah, amazing awesome. yeah because uh, for me I think like the biggest challenge for, for most of the people is being away from home during so much time exactly yeah but yeah if you keep yourself occupied I think at the end of the day you almost like don't want to go back <laughs> It's exactly like, yeah, that was my last uh, like the last month I was just didn't I didn't want to leave like from Berlin I was struggling the first month uh, like the first two months I was still in a phase of uh, finding myself in Berlin and finding myself living independently and by myself so after overcoming this thing I just wanted not to leave I was like no I don't want to leave I don't want to go back so it was also really helpful because now living here in Krakow it's way more easier to me and I really can't just, I'm just, well, I just needed one week to just settle down and find myself and, you know, it's like, I just go normally doing my routine and without any worries about being by myself, being alone in a different city because I just got the, all this informal experience. So living abroad and like living by yourself in an Erasmus, it's actually a learning outcome that belongs to informal part of the learning process during Erasmus. So I had the formal, non-formal from the organization, but also the informal part was super important for me. And it really helped me with so my soft skills, my emotional intelligence, my everything, like to overcome obstacles, to learn to be by myself, to be individually yeah. in a place. And, you know, just to say that sometimes not having someone to speak, it's, it's totally fine because, you know, I was like four people in my family living in one house. All the time you had someone to speak, like, you know, Hey, Matthew, hey, dad, hey, mom, hey, Elizabeth, my sister, for example, you know, all, all the time you're interacting. And suddenly in Berlin, I was like, hello, hello, darkness, my old friend, like, just me. And after that, I was like, you know, I get more strong, let's say, and it was super amazing to, like, now that I'm thinking of the whole process of Berlin and what I took from Berlin and, like, both from the office and living there, I just find it like priceless i wouldn't change it for anything like i don't know without a doubt you you can say that even like things that you don't at the time know that you're learning you become a user for your life and you say that you can see and say that you you grew exactly and, uh, yeah that, that that's wonderful just like uh, for me uh when i went to krakow it was the same thing i always lived with my my parents a uh, house full of uh, people you couldn't have like one moment of silence and i go to i get to to Krakow and I was like all alone in this big apartment just like you yeah. are right now and I'm sorry for that <laughs> and uh, it was the same thing and after like two or three days feeling like really weird what I'm doing here you start like to find stuff to do and how to to behave because one of my biggest uh, fears was like what am I going to do for example yeah. you have like your background in social work and a lot of projects uh, I had been to four or five projects something like that and uh, I was just like out of high school and did a professional cor professionalizing course. And I was like, what am I going to do? And yeah. the good thing that in Erasmus, it's like so flexible and every skill is good in there. That is just, just like a matter of time for you to click and find your stuff to do. And I really find like this wonderful because you have some, for everyone has like a space for them and something they can bring to the table. Exactly. That's totally like for sure. And additionally to what you said, I think Erasmus, I like Erasmus about like not exactly only like the the things you learn consciously, but about the things that 
how to say it, they just form and shape your mindset in a way that you can see the learning in every possible case, uh, like occasion and uh, situation. Like you realize things that you probably wouldn't care about or you wouldn't realize. Like, okay, I lived in Berlin by myself and okay, that, that's all. But if you just sit and have a reflection with yourself and think of what you're actually took from all this experience, and I think this is something that I took from Erasmus. I didn't have it before. I couldn't, like, I didn't realize something it's giving me a lesson, only if it was just something really important. Or, for example, I don't know, like, I broke with my girlfriend, for example, and I, I start thinking about, okay, that was my mistake, or that was her mistake, or things to avoid. But in general, in every, like, everyday life, you don't realize it. It's like, you know, super great what you're saying. For example, here in Krakow, I started learning cooking, and that's super amazing because in Berlin, I was usually eating doner kebab or cooking some pasta, super easy stuff. And here, I started cooking like mama's food, for example, like uh, like my mother is cooking, and this kind of recipes that for me it was like super difficult, and only my mom has the power to cook this dish, you know. And now I'm cooking also here, and okay, I have some fails. I mean, I'm not pro, but yeah, at least like you're learning and. Even this kind of skill, like cooking, is like super important for living in the, like by yourself. Yeah, and that's the thing that you don't even imagine that you're going to learn when you go abroad in Erasmus. Exactly, yeah. Oh my God, today you're going to learn how, how to cook for, for all the things. But uh, going back on your portfolio, you have like a lot of experience that I know. Can you tell how many projects you did? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think I've been in 25, 26 projects. Uh, for Erasmus, like the weeks for one week, plus the Erasmus placement, and this one, the European Solidarity Corps. So, in general, 27, probably, yeah. It's having how many years? Three years. Three years was a uh, back three years. And you still managed to finish our university, or? I'm, I'm still uh, having two classes more to graduate. Uh, I supposed to graduate this summer because we have the exam period, but coronavirus happened, so. We still have no announcement about the exam period and what we're going to do, what is going to happen, how we're going to be like uh, evaluated by the professors. Like, do we have to do some project? Do we have to write a research? Do we? I don't know, still. And um, mostly it was this kind of uh, change we did in at my university. So we have this kind of, we had this kind of thing in Greece that universities were in two categories and it was like the, the universities and the technological institutes. And we had this kind of, uh, let's say, um, how to say it, uh, this kind of thinking that uh, like uh, technic uh, technical institutes are like lower than universities. Yeah. So in order to change that thinking, they just, um, let's say, put like the uh, departments together, they just make one thing out of it and they made universities out of technological institutes. But in order for that to happen, they added extra classes. Ah, okay. So I had extra like 15 classes or something uh, and some more classes that I had to, I didn't pass when I was like a uh, student. So yeah, that's why it's, it took so long. Also okay. traveling and you know. It's... Yeah, but like uh, overall, besides the, the problems that were out of your control, for example, the, the Kung Flu, how I like to call it right now, yeah. and uh, the changes that uh, happened in Greece, uh, do you think the, these many projects that you did uh, influenced it on your university, like uh, made you take more time than you should? Uh, sure, and also um, I had this kind of, um, let's say, my media and all the people I have there from my university, I was actually working, let's say, without realizing that, with, without realizing it, as an ambassador for my university. So every time I was in a university, I was having like bunch of people, even not knowing them, coming to me like, "Hey, are you mafia?" I was like, "Yeah." Hey, I see your profile. You're traveling, and how you do that, and how you travel so much? And I was like, "No, I'm not rich. I'm just going on Erasmus. So you know, it's not vacation, or I'm not a tourist." Uh, and they kept on asking and doing stuff, and I've seen a lot of these people actually going on Erasmus and participating. And before coming here, I had a great uh, offer from a professor of mine. She asked me actually to, after returning back to Greece from here, to invite me to have a speech in my university, which was actually for me super like 
weird because I would be on the other side again, like on the university, I was just on the desk and listening to professor or people that they invited to speak to us. Now I'm going to be one of the guys that I'm going to speak <laughs> to future, you know, uh, colleagues, let's say. So it was, I felt super proud about it. And all of this because of traveling and, you know, uh, saying my experiences and stuff like that. And um, for example, they say in the university, this professor told me, you are, how to say it in, in English, this uh, thing though, you are a European level social worker. You know, <laughs> this kind of stuff. I was like, okay, yeah, but you know, I, I don't want to, um, let's say, speak about things like that too much. But it was super good offer and I, I think, I don't know, I don't know, I cannot imagine my life without starting Erasmus. Like, that's the thing. Like, I just uh, got improved so much with Erasmus that I cannot imagine how would how it would be my way right now. Probably, I don't know. Just, I mean, I, I probably had, would, had finished my university, but I would just work somewhere in an office and, you know, just the normal routine and yeah. of life like graduating finding a job and that's all but yeah I'm, I'm not i'm not regretting that i'm late to finish with my university because i have all this kind of experience and um, it's like you know all my my cv besides the experiences is full of you know certifications and like i have 25 certifications from erasmus projects with different topics and different <laughs> stuff so it's like a list of you know yeah, it's a couple of accomplishments. No, but yeah, that, that's great. That's what I was going to, to ask, but you even like responded for me. Because uh, even though you're like taking more time to finish university, you're probably learning more than everyone. Uh, because your your university, university uh, experience is like getting even more uh, dense with more information and other skills that you're learning. And for, for you say that, that even your teachers are like uh, appreciating uh, the, all the, the work and uh, things that you're doing. So at the end of the day, the Erasmus was like a really good um, compliment to yeah, to I absolutely. University. And, and know, for, sorry, uh, I just want to add that in general, the thing with my university is that they make you focus and they give you this kind of um, motivation to be focused more on, like let's say, uh, refugees and immigration issues, um, mental health. Um, bullying, uh, you know, this kind of hospital, clinical, social work. So they give you this motivation to be in deep waters because they're like different. But at the same time, you can see that students are, not, are having no motivation about European policies and um, European social work and, you know, and it's like so sad because I also had this thing. Every time I, we had this kind of European uh, social work, uh, multicultural social work, uh, intercultural social work we had, I was like, ah, here we go again, you know, like, I was kind of boring about these classes, but this, that was because it's, you know, the context, I think, of the class was really boring, like, there was no useful information about, like, what, okay, let's say I'm going in a European level and I'm going in an Erasmus and doing stuff, what I'm going to learn? Give me some information, something. They were just saying about uh, social work in Netherlands is doing this and that. He uses this model. I mean, okay, yeah, but I can find it by myself. Just give me something more, you know, something to motivate me. Something to... And now they're having this kind of attitude, like, I don't know how to say it, but... Um, for example, uh, it's it has to be super hard to manage. And that is like social work, you know. Soft things in social work are like, ah, okay, you know, he's doing nothing actually. <laughs> Yeah, so if there's no pathology, uh, there's no, I don't know, like uh, deaths or something hard like to manage, it's like, okay, yeah, uh, the, only that, only then you are a social worker. Differently, you are, I don't know, like, I have this, I'm having this impression at least, like, from all these years in my university. Oh, yeah, totally. But, but what is good for, for example, you're talking about, like, the lack of motivation. I think most of part of this is because you're learning uh, social work, but only like the theor theoretical part and the, the part that you did about Erasmus, you could see in action uh, social work because uh, I think I can pretty much say that a good part of projects uh, involve this part of social work. So you can like not only get the experience firsthand, but also like see with your own eyes uh, what you can do and learn more stuff and like complement everything that you're learn learning in um, university yeah. also be motivated because of that. But I think it's not like... It's not that my university is theoretical. Actually, it's like we have 
three traineeships between the studies, our studies. And it's super good and it's like super great having these traineeships. But the thing is that they are not motivating people enough to go for traineeships abroad. Or, um, I don't know, it's just malfunctioning for me. It's not, uh, instead of having um, someone to speak about this stuff, inform us about this stuff, we only have this kind of tutor, the one that uploaded this Erasmus project I told you at the beginning, only this one. Just the, like the, it was like that from all these professors in the university. Uh, but the thing is that, again, like my first traineeships were in psychiatric hospital and general hospital in Athens, which it was again psychiatric and emergencies. It was super great. I learned a lot of stuff, but it was so like it was too much for a 90 year old guy that is studying social work, like being in a hospital, seeing schizophrenics, bipolar diseases deaths, uh, young refugees, eight years old without parents. Uh, it was super hard, you know. You're getting the experience, you're getting this kind of, okay, this is my job, I have to do it. You, you, you do it, of course. But it doesn't mean if you do something softer, you're not qualified enough to be a social worker. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. No, because yeah. everyone is, like, even when we were choosing about our traineeships, uh, everyone was choosing super, like, hard and... Like movies, you know, this kind of, uh, I'm going to work in the jail. I'm going to work in this kind of jail for under 18 kids. I'm going to, you know, this, this kind of asylum. Yeah, which the is, more serious stuff. Yeah, which is okay and fine, but doesn't mean that if you go to work with, like, old guys, for example, elderly people in uh, this kind of uh, centers for, you know, uh, doing stuff and being active, mm -hmm. uh doesn't mean that you're not a, like a good social worker or you're not doing stuff like, you know, good. And I have this impression just to, you know, justify it uh, for what I'm saying. Because mostly when they say to me about Erasmus and what I'm doing there, they are always speaking to me like, oh, you're all the time on vacation, you know, just vacation. You see, I was like, no, it's, just, it's not vacation. I'm also doing stuff and it's connected to social work. Yeah, but you're traveling. It's very, like vacation. Come on, like. You know, this kind of attitude that really is like, how to say it, it's like really disturbing on on the other hand. On, like on one side, it's really disturbing. On the other, it's like, I don't know how to say it. It's like, they don't know. It's like having no clue about what is happening uh, there. Yeah, there, there's like a, a lot of stigma and uh, prejudice against the because they have no idea. They only see people traveling, so they assume it's only yeah, that. It's like, it's, I don't know what it's like. I, I think Greeks are having this thing and... Uh, that they're either tourists traveling abroad or they are super stuck in Greece and not traveling outside Greece. I don't know why it's happening. And Erasmus is like I was looking on a survey about uh, Erasmus students in foreign countries from each country in Europe. Mm -hmm. And we were like, as usual, like somewhere in the bottom. Like, I mean, this is not just a problem of the students. It's a problem also from the institutes, the universities, the schools everything that is actually educational and it's supposed to support this kind of things, which is not happening. They're like, they're, they're not saying anything. Like, you know, it's every year for City Bound and the Youth Exchange, we're just searching for participants for the Greek group. And meanwhile, in other countries, they're just, you know, participating. And I meet guys and girls 15, 16 years old, and they're like, oh, this is my fifth, this is my sixth, uh, like a Youth Exchange or, you know, pro project I participate. And I'm like, what yeah, it's usually there? the same people participating in them. Yeah, yeah, they're like really involved and really into that. But in Greece, I guess it's one of the more like many malfunction things we <laughs> malfunction like. Yeah, you know, that's great. We're gonna talk more about that more at the end. But uh, for now, I think we got an idea. How was your start? You know, we're gonna have a quick break and we'll be right back. See ya. Spoko. Erasmus Plus is the European Union program in the fields of education, training, youth and sport for the period from 2014 to 2020. The program aims to make a positive change in Europe by offering learning and cooperation opportunities. 
People and organizations from the European Union and other partner countries can take part in a variety of activities funded by Erasmus+. One part of Erasmus Plus is dedicated to youth field, supporting projects focusing on non-formal education, youth policy, and other youth-related matters. This means that it concerns a wide variety of educational organizations outside the formal school program. Young people aged 13 to 30 and adults supporting their learning can use the support of Erasmus Plus Youth. It's expected that more than 500,000 young people will benefit from this program. Funding for youth activities under Erasmus Plus aims to improve different competences and improve the employability of young people, promote young people's social inclusion and well-being, and foster improvements in youth work and youth policy at local, national, and international level. 1 billion 600 million euros is allocated to support projects within the youth field of Erasmus Plus program over the seven years. The Erasmus Plus program is structured in three key actions. Key action one is the learning mobility opportunities for individuals, both young people and youth workers. Key action two focuses on strategic partnerships, aiming at innovation and quality and strengthening cooperation among different sectors and actors, private, public, non-governmental, and others, in the field of youth work. Key Action 3 offers opportunities for young people to influence policymaking and reforms by entering into dialogue with policymakers. There are a number of great possibilities under each key action. Hello, welcome back to the second part of Behind Erasmus. We're still here with uh, the great Matthew, the man that proves that the best things come in little packages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're uh, telling us uh, that because of uh, what you did in Germany, you got to know people and that's how you got uh, this uh, internship, uh, uh, volunteership? I think that's the volunteering that you're doing right now in Krakow. Would you mind uh, telling us how the, did you end up in Krakow? So um, we had uh, the um, we had a project in January in Athens, and it was a networking meeting uh, for the partner countries. So we were actually planning all the actions we're going to do in the future. What are going to be the basic topics? What do we want to change? To change? What do we want to keep? So it was actually like evaluating the year, planning the next one, and uh, so. They just uh, proposed me there, like, hey, we have a um, free space for volunteering in Krakow. Are you interested in participating? And I was like, uh, let me think about it. And I just said yes after five minutes. So <laughs> that's good. Well, well, uh, yeah, I, I was just totally convinced that I was, yeah, you know. Uh, the, my only worry, let's say, was about uh, the reaction of my mom because she's usually, you know, kind of emotional and worrying about stuff and leaving uh, my family behind and this kind of, you know, it's not only Greek, uh, let's say, I don't know, like characteristic element, but it's happening like it's typical in my family. But yeah, here I am. So I just came in February, 15th of February. Um, I arrived here with all my stuff and uh, yeah. I go for three months now. Already? Already. And time is flying by. I still remember when you were sleeping in my couch. <laughs> <yesterday. laughs> That's good. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> That's great. And uh, what do you do now here uh, in Krakow? So here, um, uh, usually I'm, um, I sub basically I'm supposed to be here uh, besides the things we do in the office and volunteering. I also like a trainer. But Corona happens and we have no projects uh, to go. I mean, yeah, still, uh, and I don't know about the future. We we will see. Uh, here, now during quarantine, I spend time mostly doing stuff online. We applied for a project uh, for 2021 uh, in this deadline. Uh, I was also a trainer uh, with uh, Basha and Nicola from the Czech organization. Uh, for City Bound, 
uh, online. It was like online course. Uh, and actually, I, I made some videos about uh, things to do while quarantine. I don't know if you'd like to check it if you're watching the video. It's like in in somewhere in our channel, let's say. I'll make sure to, to put a link on it. But yeah, he's uh, on the this channel that the interview is going on. They are uh, really funny, by the way. <laughs> I tried my best to, you know. And um, in general, having Polish classes, learn, trying to learn Polish, uh, as you already know, because we also together have Polish classes. Tak, tak. And uh, yeah, I mean, during quarantine, we also fixed the basement. We have a basement that is now proper, let's say, to use and do stuff inside. We clean it, we do stuff about the garden also as well. So not so many stuff to do during quarantine because it's like kind of weird and you have no physical meeting meetings, no projects, no youth exchanges. So it's kind of mostly doing stuff online and yeah, that's all. And, and when there's no coronavirus outside, every day at eight at karaoke bar singing with the, exactly. <laughs> the Great Britons. <laughs> So yeah, that is the the other part of the living in Krakow. It was uh, this. I miss this pub really. So for the ones that don't know what we're we talking about, it's a pub here in the center of Krakow, and they're having a karaoke party every single day. And also, I'm a musician on my free time, recording stuff, songs, and you know, uh, singing as well. So karaoke parties for me is like I don't know, like going being a chef and going to a cooking party i don't know you know this kind of thing so we had a great time there with uh, this kind of, with bruno and this old british scottish irish people it was super nice but Same. after that we had this quarantine yeah yeah but then that happened and as you're saying you're uh, a musician you can i say you can sing and you you can play you can do it like everything and you have to find a, a way to reconcile those two things like uh the the musical part with the social work you do have you like ever did, uh, done something with those two together uh usually we let's say i do it but in during the projects more informally uh because it's like during I'm using this kind of competitions, let's say on music, uh, during their cultural evenings, or just to gather the group all together and chill together, like around the bonfire or in the seminar room, and sing some songs and just you know bring the group closer because it's like you know nice to sit, to chill with music and guitar and stuff like that. Uh, first time I'm gonna use it, uh, let's say in uh, how to say it in a more like. Uh, with a methodology, let's say I'm gonna use our arts like methodology. It's about the projects we applied uh, for 2021, uh, and it's actually the name of the project is Keep Up the Rhythm, <laughs> and it's actually about European values and solidarity, and how music and arts can be used as a tool uh, from youth workers and educators or like musicians as well. And uh, we're gonna see several stuff like how music uh, formed and promoted European the, the values we have now through the songs, the lyrics, what are they talking about these songs through the history, how values of the times were influencing the music productions and the music uh, industry at the times. Back in time, for example, nationalism was something like, uh, let's say that was in like fancy and in fashion and everyone was uh, like this kind of supporting their own country and you had a lot of songs that they were about the love about the country and uh, you know this kind of stuff uh, or songs about uh, immigration and uh, you know how music was affected and affected also uh, we're gonna see also the cultural exchange between the countries for example you know mostly i want to show through these activities that we're not as unique as we think we are i mean in a way we are because I mean, being Greek, being uh, Portuguese, being uh, German is something is that it's unique as a nationality and the characteristic you have. But as a culture, I think culture is a spectrum that you cannot actually say this is totally Greek, you know. And oh, yes. most of the times when we say that, it appears to be also Turkish or Bulgarian on the north or like from the surroundings of Greece, for example, because it's a cultural exchange through the years. And also music 
is affected and influenced by this kind of cultural exchange. You cannot say this is just Greek. I don't like. There is no way that this is just Greek. There is supposed to be something behind it, a cultural exchange, and of course there are similarities with other cultures. For example, if you go on the north of Greece, the music it's similar to Balkan music. There are huge similarities with Balkan music if you go on the north. Yeah. On the islands, you have more like different kind of music, but because of during history, for example, you have this kind of uh, Italian occupation back in time. So they have this kind of uh, mandolin sounds and they are different. But anyway, my point is that through this project, I want to show that we like I, I want participants to experience music and methodology at the same time because we still have this kind of, you know, ah, okay, it's music, just having fun. Yeah, it's having fun, of course, but. Also, music sometimes can be hard, can be difficult to make something out of it. And of course, the tool for creating music is just yourself. No one is going to tell you like, ah, okay, uh, take this and do that, for example. You just have to write your own stuff if you're a producer and doing stuff. And I want to you know, use all this kind of methodology during this project so we can find and create all together. Because I cannot know what are the needs actually of the group, so I'm just gonna we're just gonna give the environment and the the whole the whole how to say it the environment and the things we're gonna provide are gonna be like proper for participants to write a song. Uh, we're gonna record the podcast as well, and um, I, I'm just having this kind of um, for this project. I'm just split it in between in two parts, so it's like musician Matthew and social worker Matthew kind of trying to fit together <laughs> and uh, put my best to this like uh, project and I mean I made the schedule everything is ready we already applied but I wish that I hope when it's gonna happen if it's getting approved fingers crossed I hope that uh, it's gonna work because I have all these kind of ideas in my head that I want to implement and uh, also being linked to European Union and solidarity and cultural exchange, but also have music tools and music song after that. So we have outcomes. All this kind of stuff. I'm not speaking anymore. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, no, but that's uh, really awesome. Really great. I hope I got a chance at least to, to see a, a day or two, if you allow me, because it's a really great idea. And that's yeah. what I say, because you can get something that you have, have really a deep passion about, for example, your case, music. And combined with other stuff to teach people, and, and as you said, not trying to make a pun, but music is a really powerful instrument because you can use it uh, in a multiple different ways. Uh, just, just like, for example, in uh, I think it was Twinta Dictatorship in Brazil, uh, the songs needed to get approved by the dictatorship to see if, if they could put outside uh, out there. And what the musician would do, they would do write music with double meaning. Where if you read it, it uh, sounds like something. But if you're saying in the rhythm, you're saying the music, it, it kind of sounds like other stuff that was like yeah. against the the regime, and they were like using this tool to to fight it. And uh, even uh, music can use like to break barriers. Uh, rap, for example, is like probably one of the most popular genres right now. Exactly. It was from the African American community in the United States. There was like the the music that nobody talks about is like this dirty ghetto stuff and now it's like the most popular genre is like breaking barriers exactly like or make like how to say it, uh, unifying classes different classes let's say like rock for example rock was just on the street from street musicians and it was like something not in let's say in fashion and for example Beatles they actually took rock music blues and all this kind of Rock and roll. They took rock and roll actually and put it in the high class, uh, the upper classes. That's what they did actually. So it can unite classes, the cultures. For example, we have, for example, this kind of uh, we have this kind, of, this great singer in Greece. Uh, his name is Haroulis. But anyway, he's actually he actually did what? He took traditional music from Crete and he make made it. Uh, let's say easy to listen to anyone, uh, even young people that would be like, "Oh, this is too traditional. I cannot listen to it." He just gave this kind of, uh, let's say, um, character in this kind of traditional music from Crete that is easy to hear. Also, like if you are not into that, so also it unites different 
cultures and it can be like that. And yeah, this is great. great. I like when, for example, singers are making this kind of cooperations from uh, with artists from different countries. And this is super great. And this is also my thought about the song we want uh, we want to do during the projects to be in different languages. And I did it once in a project in Antalya in Turkey and it totally worked. And I was so in, like impressed from this. Yeah, which, which uh, sorry to interrupt. By the way, I, I want to put the link of this song uh, on the description because it was like a really good song. <laughs> it was really uh, yeah, it was uh, super nice, and they had a great idea about it. And I just want to do the same. And just you know, I was I was so impressed. I was like, wow, that's great, you know. And sitting all together, writing the lyrics, and it was so funny because we, we all write it, lyrics about solidarity and against hate in Europe and all this kind of stuff, and. We were after that. They asked us to translate the lyrics in English, and everyone had used this kind of a really slang um, <laughs> like language and uh, using words that you can translate. And I was, I did the same, and I was like, "Oh, how do I translate that now?" But yeah, I did. It, it lost its meaning, to, it, like the context, the meaning were were lost somehow. But I just. Did it, I don't yeah, know. No. Yeah, it's wonderful because music really like reflects the society. It's always like evolving and shaping and getting different mixtures. And yeah, and as you said, like no, nowadays, I think uh, Spanish is getting like really popular for because of the Spanish music in Spanish. A lot of people know some words here and there. The same goes for yeah. English. And it's a really like a because doesn't matter where you're from, there's music in, in your country and everybody listens to music. So I really think that's. Not trying to say instrument again, but it's a good instrument to share values and show your culture, and that's why I really think that this project is like a really good idea that you're writing. Yeah, fingers crossed that it gets approved. For sure, it's going to get for what you told me, and that's okay. going to be a success. But uh, let's go go back to to Krakow. Um, this is not your first time in there, right? In Krakow, no. It's yeah. like I've been here three times before. And now I'm living here, so I have experience about Krakow. And it was also the same about Berlin. I was five times before there in Berlin, and then I moved there. But yeah, so it's a city that I've seen, and uh, I just want to discover like different parts, not so like touristic mainstreams. And I mean, it's a like I don't know, it's like super beautiful city, and everywhere is amazing to see, and just you know. Uh, but yeah, I don't have this kind of tourist feeling, I have more the feeling, let's say, local, Krakowian, let's say, because I've seen the main stuff. And it's like living in my like home in Athens. I have this feeling of comfort and all cool, all good, you know. Yeah, because uh, I was going to say, I think Krakow was like a really good choice to do, uh, at least for me, it was to do a volunteering because it was such a like a, a welcoming city and you have like a, a lot of stuff to do. And you have like this big community of, um, I think I can say social workers and, and people who work with Erasmus. Because, for example, we were in the at the book club um, where we were like talking about possible, possible, yeah. And I really think it's like it's a really good idea because it gives like a, a lot of freedom for you to to do your stuff, and they have like this supporting uh, infra infrastructure that can help you if you want to do like some uh, social work, some projects. Uh, you get help from there. Uh, you are uh, what was your uh, city that you came from? Sorry? What? Uh, what was your city that you came from? Athens, uh, from Athens. Uh, from Athens. In Athens, you know or you feel that there's like a, this uh, structure that's like friendly for foreigners and that help you do some social work? Um, there are some NGOs. Uh, we have several NGOs uh, doing uh, European Solidarity Cor Corps projects and taking uh, volunteers that they live in Athens and uh, doing stuff. But I don't think like, I don't know. If it's something supportive, there is like projects and they support this kind of um, projects and they do also. But in general, as a, um, let's say, I don't know how to say it. As a society, of course, there, it has a lot of things to do. Like uh, Athens is, is combining, like, let's say, a lot of stuff. You can find like... Uh, urban things to do, arts, everything. It's like you can do stuff in Athens for sure. But I'm not sure if it's actually linked with somehow uh, with the NGOs. You know what I'm saying? Like you're actually, 
I don't know, like something that I never thought about, like because I'm local, so I, I I never thought about it. But actually, I know that there are NGOs that they are supporting uh, volunteers. We have volunteers from other countries with uh, EVS or European Solidarity Corps, like post EVS, European Solidarity Corps. Uh, so yeah, but I don't know if it's like um, I don't know, like I cannot answer this one probably. Like I just know that NGOs are having this kind of uh, let's say, things to provide, and Athens as a city is a friendly city. We are used to tourists, and uh, people are so, like, okay with tourists, you know. They are not annoyed by that or something, you know. For example, the, on the place I hang out mostly in Athens, most of the times you can hear different languages because there are Erasmus students or people that came for European Solidarity Corps or, you know. So, I guess, yeah. Okay, because uh, you, you were talking like the first part uh, about how usually people don't really know uh, what Erasmus is or how it works, and uh, it's like the the same here. I live in Lisbon; it's a big, big multicultural city, metropolitan city. You have like a lot of uh, different cultures, mm -hmm. and uh, as you say, you go to a, a, a cafe or bar, you hear like multiple languages. But uh, you have like kind of infrastructure for NGOs. You have like some here and there. The the government even like. Um, give some NGOs like a, a office for, for they to have, but they don't really, let's say, promote to, to the average citizen that uh, there's like these opportunities and stuff like that. And uh, I think I can say like, in uh, at least in Athens, as you said, people don't really know about it. Do you think it's because uh, it's a problem that the NGOs don't do enough publicity or the government doesn't help enough, the people don't have interest in? Uh, I think it's like, Okay, that's. Uh, I have to think what I'm gonna say in order not to be uh, offensive to Greeks. Um, okay, I think for the first reason is because that it's not something that educa education is promoting from the really like early stages of education. Uh, so we're not. They're not used of it like uh, as an idea. And they also have this kind of different approach in education. It's totally formal. So. They like somehow and dislike this kind of um, Stockholm syndrome relationship with education. Yeah. Because they they hate the way it's been taught, but at the same time they feel qualified only if it's that way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I couldn't put it better. <laughs> it's exactly, exactly better. Stockholm syndrome. You hate it, but you only feel like worthy enough if it's only in that way. And when it's something different, you just... I don't know, sabotaging the whole thing. You're like, okay, yeah, come on. It's just a certificate in one, in one week and also what? So they get it like that. It's like the more you suffer, the more it shows you really care. And, you know, like Offspring says in a song anyway. So it's like that. They have to suffer in order to feel qualified after that. And I get it that like good things take time and they need like to work for them, but you can also do that non-formally. That's my point. And I'm trying to say that, that you can also do that non-formally. You, you can struggle, you can have this Stockholm syndrome if you want, but you can do it non-formally. You don't have to be behind a desk and just getting information. Yeah, I think it's just like you said, people are, are too stuck thinking that the only way you can really learn something is between four walls and with an old person telling you what to do and how to think. Yeah, and, and they're feeling like uncomfortable with the idea of taking their, because that's the thing, if you have this kind of totally freedom, not exactly freedom, but you have way more freedom to do stuff by your own. Somehow you're getting afraid of the responsibility after all this time, you know what I'm saying? When you're in the class, you're just sitting as a plant in there taking information and suddenly you go on a project and they ask you to act, to do stuff as you wish. And you're like, what do you mean as I wish? <laughs> you know, you're getting this feeling like, what do you mean? As I want? And you know, and after that you're expecting evaluation. How, uh, okay, what's my grade? There's no grade. How do you think about what you did? And you're like, I don't know. Yeah. Do you like it? it, it, I don't, it it's, it's, that's not the point. You know, you have to learn how to give reflection to yourself and self evaluate, actually. And yeah, I think this is the first reason about Erasmus. Uh, so they have it in, in their head more like fun and something that you go to have fun yeah you do have fun also if you go but it's not only that it's as i said i had a speech on uh, think you uh, which is like a platform 
uh, with online seminars. And I was speaking about Erasmus in Greek there. And as I said, it's like formal education. The more you study, the more the better the results. And it's exactly the same non-formal education. You cannot expect just to go to a project and suddenly here I am, Mr. Emotional Intelligence and Soft Skills guy. I'm perfect. You know, you have to work on it as well. And you have to work on yourself and your skills and everything. Anyway, second reason I believe that this, this is not something people in Greece like is because they like to be tourists, let's say. They're, you know, as a culture, they, they are in love with vacations. Vacation is like, you know, wow, we just wait the whole year, Christmas and Easter to have vacation. And making vacation, of course, mean like doing whatever I want. No schedule, no time, just going, eating, drinking, partying, and that's all. I mean, it's mentality, I get it, and I also had it. And when you uh, just say to them that you're going to go to a different country, they're going to pay for your tickets, but you're going to have you you'll have to do stuff there and meet people. And they're like, ah, I don't know. Like, you know, it's like, yeah, but I prefer to do my own stuff and not waking up in the morning. And it also happened like I had this kind of situations in uh, once in Berlin. It happened anyway, like, you know, waking up at 12 when we were starting at 10. And, you know, this kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah, it's totally the mentality. They just like, I don't know, because they haven't experienced it. It's like, let's say it's a reason and an outcome of the first reason I told you before. So it's kind of like this combination. They never taught the different way. They don't know the different way. They are not familiar with it. So they're actually preferring tourism and just going for vacation which is okay. I also have been for vacation in a different country and doing just meeting with friends and partying. But I, I'm not doing only that. That's my point. And they're not used of it, so they don't actually know. They're like, how to say it? They just want to go in front of Eiffel Tower, take a picture, a selfie, and uh, eat a croissant, and then go back to Athens. Which is nice because you take experiences and you see stuff, but you are just returning mostly the same you're not changing something you're not gaining something besides instagram photos and uh, satisfaction about your narcissism which is okay but yeah i mean i don't know i'm totally pissed off with this kind of uh, with this issue and i'm also saying for example to one of my friends he's never he never been abroad and i'm really struggling with my other best friend we're like three to make him part- go with us in Erasmus project yeah, Me and Kostas were going to Erasmus projects like crazy. We participate all the time. We find projects to go. And we're trying to convince Nick. And he's like, I don't know. I don't speak English. I, I, would, I wasn't speaking as well. Like, so just come, you know. And you can see this kind of, how to say, this kind of will and this kind of motivation inside. Like, how was it? What did you do? Wow, really? You know, this kind of, I would like to do this kind, this thing you do, but I'm afraid. So you can see this kind of, like let's say confused like confused behavior because it's like the it sounds super nice and it's super nice to do but they are afraid because you know i just already explained and also i believe that third reason is that um, it's not promoted enough by the government as well it's something that um, they don't actually i don't know why but they're not promoting erasmus and projects like that enough and so it's kind of like a vicious circle that goes and goes around and goes around so it's like government government is not caring about european stuff education as an outcome is not giving enough information and they're not teaching something different and then you don't care about erasmus projects so you don't participate or most of the people are like that you know vacation having fun and i get it as i said but it's like just try something different and uh, it's like i don't know and i hate it also i'm gonna say that because every time they ask me like hey how you do how you go to all these countries and uh, how you find the money and how you do it's like and i'm like i went for for example when i went to spain i was in uh, barcelona and in alicante and when i was in alicante my friend jonathan hosted me and when jonathan came to athens i hosted him so Already we have no money, like we just keep the money for vaca- for accommodation. And they're like, oh, so you have friends? Yes, because I go to Erasmus projects. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? Like they are actually 
wondering how is it possible when they are not even willing to try to see if it's possible. And you, they just put the label Erasmus equals vacation, okay, and they're just not caring. And it's like, anyway, I'm sad and angry about this topic and my locals, my Greek. Guys, anyway. yeah, yeah, but no, I agree with you. I think in Portugal is uh, almost, almost the same because just like Greek, we have like a, a really old population older, and yeah, I get it. The older people, they are stuck in their ways. No problem with that. My problem is usually with the the younger generations because they still stuck like that. Um, I I try to do uh, promotion in, in schools to, to talk about Erasmus and Proj. I like I was in communicating to me like tw uh, twelve. 14 different schools in different zones. Uh, only like four got back to me to, to respond. Uh, only two said, yeah, maybe we're going to see. And one said, okay, yeah, you can do that. Then I, I went to a meeting, explained them what it was. They said, oh, no, this is going to uh, um, not not help our students. It's going to do the, the opposite of it. Exactly. I, was like, I was like, no, but it's not like a substitution for school. Or it's going to just for them to have fun. It's going to be like some complementary, complementary stuff. Because they, they learn the maths, they learn the, the languages and, and everything. But for example, they don't know uh, social skills and uh, practice, uh, they practice their English uh, in person or be independent. It's like a good compliment. They were like, oh, no, no, no we don't want them to, to miss uh, <laughs> days. So it's the same. And that's the reason actually also because in that way, you're actually transforming their, how to say, their aims for future life, their, their future achievements. You're just putting these achievements in a in a box. You're just you're just giving a framework, and you're like, okay, this is how you have to act. So you're actually saying, school, university, job, and you can do your vacation in between. And uh, this is super bad because it's like a like it's like a let's say I don't know, it's like a, a factory. Okay, yeah. yeah, it's like a factory when you produce people and they all do the same steps and the same stages without any difference which I get it it's like capitalistic society you have to do that in order to survive in this society but this thing is you have also different chances to see different stuff and do different stuff but they just uh, are stuck with this habit it's a habit and it's hard to get rid of it and I think I got rid of it because it was at the phase a stage of my life that I was really wondering what am I supposed to do right now because I was just studying in the university and uh, I had nothing else to do and I was like okay is it gonna be studying and just that and I like to do stuff I'm active I don't like sitting and doing nothing I want to do stuff I feel more like energetic and more like this kind of you know motivation after I do stuff so it came at the right moment I think of my life and uh, all this enthusiasm I still have about Erasmus is just kept me on going and participating because it was like like a drug, let's say. Yeah, it's, it, it's what I say this all the time and start to become yeah. like a jargon because because like you go drug. for a week and you're like I want more and you go again and it was like okay I want more and you know and maybe you will go to a project that it wasn't so good and you're gonna be next one, <laughs> you know and it's so great. No, I'm, I'm starting to think of changing this program name for, for Erasmus Junkies instead of Behind Erasmus because <laughs> it's always like everyone says the same. Uh, exactly. Yeah, exactly. For, for me, it was the same stuff. I, I, I finished high school. Uh, I, I really, really, really hated school. Like, didn't work for me. I wasn't motivated. It's not that my, my, my grades were bad, but like zero motivation to do it. Uh, and then I was like, no, but yeah, well, what I need to do now? University, yeah, more study. I don't want to do that. So I took like a more um, informal, like a professionalizing course in uh, public relations. I was like, oh yeah, cool. They, uh, I get to study the pace I want. I do the exams when I'm filled and I'm ready. Okay, nice. I didn't know that was this. And then my friend just say, so um, we need someone to go in a youth exchange like in two days. Want to go? I don't know what he was talking about. He said, Germany, free two days. Oh, okay, I'm going. <laughs> and yeah, and I went in there. I was like really uh, start to understand that yeah, formal education is just like one type of education. Guess what? That education wasn't for me. I, I had like a little small taste of uh, non-formal education, and then I have like this full one in this project. And yeah, since that, I was like, oh no, wait! I don't hate learning. I love learning. I hate learning between four walls. In that way, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and there's the same thing. I got back 
and I, and I became one of the, the preachers of Erasmus I was like telling everyone this is amazing yeah. you need to do it it's wonderful everyone was like no 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 I was like why don't you want to do this it's like hard to believe that you have like this wonderful opportunity that the European Union gives you and you're just like ah, no I don't want you like but, uh, it's a really nice opportunity but that, now that you're saying that it's like I believe that the first reaction is no because it's something totally strange to them So when you see something totally strange, you're directly like, no, you know, you're thinking about it. And for me, I'm totally sure that one of the reasons that they are not go- doing that is because of the English. At least in Greece, I believe it's English, like uh, how to sp- gonna speak in English or stuff like that. Because I grew up learning English and we had this thing that I still remember it. And I'm like, why? I don't get it. But anyway, when we were like uh, in the um, school learning English, uh, they were trying to teach us how to have the, you know, the accent of speaking in English and not having yeah. totally like... And every time someone was trying to speak with an accent, for example, in, if you say, I try in Greek, in totally Greek accent, you're going to be, I try. Which is, you know, and every, every time someone was about to try to say it with the American accent or we had also about British accent when especially in British accent because we were giving about Cambridge the certification when someone was trying to speak like uh, I don't know with British especially with British accent it was uh, I don't know they were just starting mocking him or her and be like oh really you know and doing this kind of mocking yeah. which is like why I'm just learning a language different language I should learn how to pronounce the words as well it's part of learning a language It's okay to have your own accent, but you have to try at least to, to pronounce the words correctly. So I grew up having this kind of not good relationship with English because everyone was like, okay, yeah, you know, I'm just going to use English for uh, ordering from Amazon or I don't know, like uh, play any video games or stuff like that. But when it's about to speak, they're just, I don't know. It's, uh, it's I think I have the impression that it's happening because of that, at least. As when when I was grew, like when I grew up, I saw that uh, it was all these years just learning English as like grammar and uh, this kind of you know words vocabulary, but not accent because I, I was like not doing the accent because they would mock me or you know being like that, and it was something really like I don't know sad anyway. <laughs> yeah, uh, for, for me. It's like it's 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 funny because I was almost the the other way. Because for example, I I come from Brazil and like I learned something last week that I still can't believe quite that is true. Uh, that only five percent of the population is like 300 million people. Only five percent is like fluent in English. And uh, in my English, I don't think my English is like close close to fluent. But I, I get to speak. I I was in Krakow. The only language I was speaking was English. And like June last year. I was like terrified of speaking English. Uh, when I went to the project, I was like, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, no, just like monosyllables because I was scared because yeah. they had to mock me for my accent and blah, blah, blah. And then after the, the project, I started to feel like more comfortable. And the more comfortable you are, the more confident you are. And if you're like not trying too much to force a, an accent that you don't have, it becomes like more natural and you speak more. So I, I think that's like good not to be too... Um, To start in, with feel too much fear of speaking uh, with an accent because everyone have one. It's like I don't think there's like a, a right accent because who is going to say who which is right? Because from city for city, uh, <laughs> it, it I mean locals or British can say that because it's like you just speak with your accent and they don't understand anything and they're like what wait what? Yeah, yeah. But at the end of the day, in, in the projects, uh, I really feel that there's no need like to fear if you don't speak uh, like a, a good English or like a, a perfect one, because n- almost no one, no one there uh, for the whole project I did, there was like no one who was like a native of, of English. Course, yeah, exactly. It's super inclusive, like group and environment, because we're all not British, not native speakers anyway, and we're all speaking English in our way with our accent and. Yeah. It's okay to speak like that. And that there's like no, no need to be ashamed. A and you, you usually, for example, in youth exchange, you have like the team leaders that their job is like for real to help you uh, even communicate if you can't. Like, and yeah. the good part about non farm education is because you don't like teach people uh, what you have to teach. You need like to adapt to the groups, not the group that has to adapt to you. 
Because exactly. in, in school you have like the the really fast students that need to wait for things. They have like the students that need more time and they just like get laid over back there. In, in North formal education, there's not like this. The, um, you need to adapt to your group and and teach them better. And, and that's like what something really bothers me when people say, "No, I don't go because of the English." Was like, no. And so actually, not even trying to teach you, but they are just giving you provide you the environment to discover your potential. Learning to learn, how's this? Exactly, yeah, and you're just, and you're you have your time. That's it. You have your own rhythm. You may like not speak so much the first days, but then the rest of the days, you you know, you're going your way. You're doing your stuff as you wish, as you like, and this is how you learn with no pressure. Let's say you're just like, in informally mostly, or you know, when people are coming to speak to you, and you know, you're afraid to speak, but you try at least, and. Day by day is getting better, but at least you have to try to do it, and it's gonna be better. It's a, it's a safe space. As I said, my, my first day, I, I only said yes or no and hello and goodbye, and 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 now, not, not even a, a, almost a what one month to be a, a year since my first project. I'm I'm hosting an interview in English. Uh, I I do a volunteer completely in English. I'm doing projects with Polish English. In English. I'm learning another language, language in another in language. language. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I really don't don't feel that feel uh, fear anymore. And, and that's why I say I tell to every friend. I'm, the more projects I do, the more I come back, more excited to tell them to go. The more they say <laughs> no, the more angry I get. I'm about to, like just kidnap someone and okay, project you're going. Just, exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. And, and and for me, it would be like really simple, just for the government at least allow. Um, NGOs to at least have like a day, a public event in schools, just to say, there's this option. You you can go. It's for everyone. Don't worry about this and that. And it doesn't cost anything because the NGOs are, are not in this for the money. At least they are not supposed to. They are in this to help people, yeah. and they want to help. The problem is that all the obstacles that are uh, trying to like not let them do that for the reason that I don't know. But who knows? But okay, Matthew. Uh, we sorry, have something to say? I said I agree with what you said about schools that they are like from a different century and education should be different right now. And it's like you just see that they, they don't change through the year. They're still the same class, the same desk with the teachers, with the same approach. So that's it. Anyway, different yeah. discussion, yeah. but yeah. Mm -hmm. as, uh, as I said, like in the, the pilot episode, we have like a uh, a 19th century educational system with people from the 20th century for people from the 21st century. It's like yeah. two, two centuries uh, late. Exactly, late, that's super right. Like yeah. Ridiculous. Everything is changed besides schools. That's supposed to be like the most important stuff. Exactly. Well, Matthew, we're going to get a quick break now. We've been talking a lot and we'll mm -hmm. be right back. Okay. Prava demokracija i jaka tolerancija 
ne to nije, baš nikakva zezancija Pusti sada sve, te stare loše priče Jer ti jesi samo jedno ljudsko biće i mali korak, za sada bit će dovolja Za promjene, za tebe, mene Za ljude dobre volje Koji žele da se bore Da stvore svet pun mira Ljubavi i sloge Jaša, jaša, jaša mali gör mene Doj mala bil mene Uš majmun bili terk etmeli Kir lezzet nefret ve beyni Kanlı elleri Nefreti gömelim toprağa çünkü Sevgi yaşar beni Hello everyone, welcome back to the final part of this great interview. I'm still here with the even greater Matthew. And Matthew, got a big question for you. What does the future hold for you? So, um, as, I, as I'm planning at least, uh, till next year, 2021, like February, January, I don't know, I'm going to be here in Krakow. Um, and after that, going back to Greece. Um, we have this kind of... Um, like from a past century thing in Greece that the army is obligatory. Uh, yeah. So I still haven't done my army duty. So I have to go and uh, I'm going to be for nine months in the army. And uh, I don't know. I mean, that's my plans for the further future. Like it's going to take 2000 is going to be 2021 and nine months from 2021 is going to be in the army. So this is planned till the end of 2021, maybe 2022. So in general, because of the army, I have no many options of planning. So everything is going to be after that. Uh, but in general, my plans include, for example, for sure, um, Erasmus and do something like relevant to that. Um, music with my band, like continue our concerts and play to some places or maybe we we're planning to make a tour in Greece, like on some islands or like or maybe in different cities. We will see. Um, and the army, which is kind of disturbing because you they just it just cut your plans and you have just to spend nine months, like, peeling potatoes and um, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the the same boat, but luckily I don't live uh, I live in Portugal. But if I go back to Brazil, I need to do a year of military service, mandatory. Exactly. Yeah. So if I if I wait, uh, I think it's like two more or three, two or three more years here. If I go back, it's okay. I don't need to do it. So at least I, I got that. You have, yeah, you have this option. But for us, if we if we don't do that, we are considered as um, skipping like the duty. I don't know if there's a word in Greek. I don't know in English. Uh, and you have, you can go to jail basically. Or you can after after like specific age, uh, you can also buy your duty you by pay paying some. Duty? Yeah, you just pay the army and you just you're okay. You, mm, you're isn't done. that great? Huh? But it's thousands of euros. I'm not. Uh, rem I'm not remembering the number exactly. I'm not sure, but yeah, you can do something like that. So in you. general, that's my plans for. Uh, the future and I'm also planning for later for later in the future to do a master uh, Somewhere abroad, but I don't know where exactly and I'm basically planning to live again like from Greece and go somewhere But I don't know that's like really future like long future from him now. So we'll see you know, on a more personal note, since you have like lived in so many different countries, do you feel that you can like go back to Greece and just live there, or do you feel now that you get tasted the the traveler's way, you can go back and stay there for longer times? Uh, so um, I I have this kind of uh, um, let's say uh, I don't know how to say my big word in English, but it's like I'm in between of two feelings, which is hating Athens for 
its routine and uh, the crowded uh, like transportation, the malfunctioning transportation that is not working properly. And uh, for me, it's a city that I don't want to stay more in there, let's say. Or if I do so, I want to find something like, I don't know, a, a flat somewhere more quietly <laughs> in a more quiet place in Athens, but Athens is Athens, I don't know. But in general, I prefer Athens just for, I don't know, night out or just, you know, weekend. During the week, it's a chaos. I don't like it. I, I just don't like it. But at the same time, I have people I love there. Like all of my, my family is there. My best friends are there. Like everyone is there from the people I love. And uh, that's something that actually makes me, you know, wonder if, should I sacrifice my future living in Athens? Sacrificing, you know, uh, not literally sacrificing, but, you know, living in Athens and being with my people or just live somewhere else and start something new. I'm, but I'm probably sure that um, I'm going to end up somewhere else, not in Athens probably, because it's like uh, after I came back from Berlin, I I was like going out with my friends, seeing the people I miss, you know, it was super nice. But after the days passed and I got back to the routine, I was like, okay, that is not okay because I was used of Berlin, which was perfect for like the transportation, the like the the, the space of the city. You had space in the city. You the the like the pavement was huge. The streets were huge. You could see the sky, like you know, Athens is like a small city actually, but and every building is like really stuck next to each other, stuck to each other, and in that way you have a small city in size, but uh, bigger, even bigger in population. So everything is squeezed in Athens for me. You have this feeling that everything is squeezed in order to fit more people because of the movement that happened back in time that everyone from the villages moved to the center. So from 11 billion people, 11 billion, 11 million people in uh, Athens, in in Greece, you have almost five, four, I'm not, like four or five, something like that in um, Athens, which uh -huh. is too much, like for the size of the city as well. Uh, so yeah, after that, I, was, I had this feeling that this is not something, it's an extra stress, extra stress, super stressful, super tiring after this kind of, okay, I'm going to go to the bus stop. I mean, about Berlin, you go to the bus stop, three minutes, the bus is there. You just wait a few minutes, you're you you just you're just cool, you're not stressed that if you're going to lose your bus, you go have to wait 20 minutes. You know, it's like, you just that don't compare. And I mean, I just want to live in a city that my routine is not that stressful because of factors that I cannot change. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. <laughs> And also Krakow here is a really quiet city, small city, beautiful city with a lot of green parks. The river is super nice. And I'm pretty sure that after going back to Athens, it's like going to be like the same feeling, even worse, maybe. Oh, yeah. Cause, cause I, I'm that... already missing Krakow. It's just, just like just like you said about, about Greece uh, here in Lisbon, the same thing. It's like even I stereotype that Portuguese people don't, they are always late. It's not like a, a personal thing. It's like the transportation is always exactly. late that you yeah. get used used to be late. Yeah. And it's like, I don't know. I, I would say that I only, the things I miss are not linked to the city of Athens. Uh, maybe some specific places because of the people I've been there with. So it's like uh, places I chill with my friends, where we hang out. And they're, ni they're super nice places. But I think that the places I, most, I mostly miss from Greece is places linked to the sea, you know, going to the beach, swimming, these kind of places. I wouldn't say that I miss something like from Athens. I don't know. I just maybe just chilling and drinking coffee, what, like seeing uh, Acropolis or Parthenon, which is OK, but it's something I'm used to it. So nothing special here, let's say. The food probably is something I'm gonna miss. Like um, like, you know, your food is always the best. Uh, wherever, like from wherever you are, it doesn't matter. 
Uh, so probably the food and um, yeah, I don't know. I am not satisfied with Athens, not at all, let's say. So probably I'm gonna, I'm seeing myself somewhere else in the future. Okay, and you think or have any plans or you would like to uh, do some project or any uh, uh, social work in Athens? Or maybe create even your own NGO, I know. Uh, I had this kind of uh, plan with my best friend from the university to start doing this kind of uh, social education, let's say. So actually using non-formal education to teach students uh, social skills, soft skills, uh, but students not from Athens. So we're planning to actually uh, target on people from with fewer opportunities and from rural areas. So we plan to go on islands or like villages uh, with uh, not so many people and with kids that they're probably seeing only the village and you know they don't know a lot of stuff about what is happening outside the village or probably i don't know they see from internet probably but you know uh so we were planning to do this kind of on move uh how to say it uh project yeah. where we actually go from place to place and we actually work with the local community and teaching um, this kind of uh, non-formal education and Erasmus and what it is about and this kind of uh, team building activities as well. And probably also the teachers and the people that work there, different ways to approach and, you know, not just the 8th, 19th century thing. Uh, so that's a plan that we have in general and I like it because it's not located in Athens. It's something that is around and not in the centers. Uh, and it's a good way to see also Greece because the thing is that I'm traveling mostly abroad and I've, I, I haven't seen a lot of stuff in Greece. Just specific places and uh, not so many islands, for example. I mean, you cannot see all of them. Probably there are like too many, but uh, you know, not it's, not, a, it's a, not a good amount of like places I've been for the years I lived there, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Totally. We are the same here. Uh, last year I've been to 10 or 12 different countries in half a an year. And I've been in Portugal for almost 10 years. I've been to two cities. <laughs> the one I live and the one next to it. Yeah. So I understand. But yeah, it's, a, it's a really good plan uh, that you have. Sounds, sounds like really something great and uh, nice to do. Not only for the people, but for yourself. Uh, too. They don't have it. I never heard something about it. In We never heard of something about it in Greece. So I think it's also innovative and something like an, an initiative that is gonna like give stuff to people and students or like teachers. But it's still like really in a embryic stage. So we're just thinking and planning about it, but for the future again, because he also has to do the army duty. So we plan to go together in the army and just do our stuff after that. We'll see the future is like, you know, hiding a lot of stuff. I hope so. Well, sounds great. Uh, there's some stuff, uh, something that I really like to ask uh, at the end of every podca podcast interview. Uh, is that is there like something in the Erasmus program that you think should change or you would like to change? Maybe something negative or that you would like not to exist anymore, or something positive that you would like them to add? Um, I mean, it depends. Like for me, it's like every other profession and every other job. So the outcomes of your profession is based on how good you are and what you're doing. So I've been in really bad projects uh, with like really bad accommodation, really bad, uh, I don't know, like uh, equipment. And I, it was just disaster, just, you know. But I've been in projects that were super perfect and super cool. Uh, but there's a huge variety of projects and I don't know if like what it would be something to change in general. So I'm just trying to think something that would fit in every project in general. And it's something in common that I've seen in every project. Um, so, so you would like, like something like a, a better quality management from the part of the European Union to make sure that every project there's like some standards that they fulfill? Something like that, for example, uh, I, I don't know if it's possible to be plummeted and if it's going to be the trouble for like the paperwork and the applications and, you know, uh, but for example, it's like 
you 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 have this feeling when you go to these projects that the money they took weren't like they didn't make a good use of this money actually. Okay. So you are like, I'm pretty sure that for this hotel here you're not paying. Like I guess you paid just six euros for the room or something. For example, I was in this project in the middle of summer in Bulgaria, and it was the room we had was with no air condition, not even a fan inside. So every morning I was waking up some kilos less because of sweating at night. And it was really like, I, the food, it was awful. I mean, I, you don't have to be Gordon Ramsay to see that this food is not like edible. It was like, I don't know, just disaster. So I would like something, I would say something more, not that like a check or something, but something to, yeah, as, as you said, some, um requirements in order for the project to be implemented and happen because it was like no way that all this money like got for the accommodation there was no way for that like i don't know um and also but i don't know if this can be changed somehow i hate the participants that they are actually coming and not caring enough about the project in, in oh. the but in a way that it's not something like I don't like it as a project it doesn't fit to my expectations so I'm disappointed you know it's not something like that if it's something like that I totally get it and I understand that you came here you didn't know what to expect you don't like it it's not for everyone I get it it's cool but it's mostly when you see people using Erasmus just for vacation literally vacation just tourism so they're just coming and they are always late they are just doing other stuff uh they're just there for partying and having fun and uh, nothing else and when you try to facilitate and do an activity they're just so like you know not into that or asking like okay so why do we do that now and what's the purpose and you know this kind of uh sabotaging let's say the quality of the project and not by like i mean not that they tend to do it like on purpose but it's something that through all of these kind of behaviors they end up just ruining the whole thing and it's okay. something i hate because you're just taking money from european union and instead of in like in their position it could be someone else that really wanted to be you know what i'm saying yeah, and you just totally. have this kind of uh uh, yeah, guys, that yeah. we are, <laughs> yeah, doing this be, kind of stuff. Be, be, because that, that, it's not like you're traveling for free. It's like an investment that the European Union is, is doing on you. So exactly. this should take it serious. Uh, because in the certain way, you're paying for that. Your tax money, your father's tax money, your friend's tax money is going to this investment on you. And but there's no me... way, unfortunately, to see if like the participant is going to be like that. Because you just have the... Like the application that they sent, they applied and you just read what they answer to your questions about the project. And I mean, talking is just talking. Everyone could be good in talking. But actually, for example, you can see a perfect, uh, like you can see perfect answers for the project, the, for the questions we said to choose the participants. And the same guy with the perfect answers can be just a tourist in the project and doing nothing. So they know, like they, it's like, I don't know, like in school, you write just what you want them to hear, you know. I may disagree, for example, I was writing uh, exams in, in high school for religion. And we had this kind of classes about Christianity and other religions. And I was just writing things that they wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah, you know, I wasn't writing what yeah, I really yeah. because I needed Sorry. Uh, Because I needed the grade. And they need to participate, so they just write what we want to hear. So I don't know if this gonna, there's going to be a way of uh, checking this thing also. Yeah, no, uh, me, me and Martin uh, from the, the pilot episode, we discussed about this because that's, I think it's my biggest problem uh, that we need like a more strict and more uniform uh, recruitment system where like every association needs to, or every organization needs to find these uh, participants following this recruitment. And usually uh, they say that you need to have a, a meeting either in person or virtually with the participants before you send them. 
I don't think they have not many people do that many organizations. I think that's like a big problem. Uh, yeah. But yeah, totally agree with I that. I think that as, as, on the other hand, um, Erasmus projects should be inclusive, and that's something we support during the projects. You support inclusive societies and societies that they give chances to people. But so it's kind of controversial on the other hand. So it's like, okay, you should you want to check the quality of the project, but at the same time, you cannot be exclusive and say to someone, ah, you know, you're not like, you know, I don't know. I mean, I guess that it's something that it's, um, we cannot control, actually, we cannot check it. And I, we, I guess we just have to find a way in the project to motivate them to be more like and participate or at least not be such uh, troublemakers, let's say, you know, try to find a way to con manage the, their behavior or, you know, motivate them somehow. So I guess it's gonna, we're gonna have to face it for the rest of the years as well. Or, or just uh, have an idea too. Yeah. After the project, if you try, try and you don't work, you just like, have like this black Erasmus list where you put the name of participants who didn't. <laughs> the, the, the death note. <laughs> the death note of Erasmus, exactly. <laughs> Something like that. But yeah, I guess, uh, for example, we, I, it's, it's something like I say, and um, it's not blackmailing, but it's actually something that is truth, that you have to participate at least on eight to like 80% of the project. Otherwise, you don't, you're not taking the money back. So it's something that you, like, people are getting as blackmailing, but it's not blackmailing, it's just, this is how it works. I mean, it's this is your last card, for example. It's not something you say from the like very beginning, but if you see that it's not working and nothing you did or tried is actually having any like uh, results on this person, you just actually say, okay, you know, this is a rule. You have to participate in 8% of the project. If you don't do that, you have no money back. And suddenly they change. So, I don't know. Magically, right? <laughs> it's all about money, I guess, again. It's all about money. Okay, Mef, let's do now a, a lightning round. When I ask you a lot of questions, you just like like the first thing that came up to your mind. Okay. Remember that maybe there are kids watching, so be careful. Okay. <laughs> okay, so favorite country to travel? Favorite country to travel? Um, my first plan is Croatia. Croatia, okay. And uh, your favorite uh, country to, um, to live in? That's a tough one. Uh, country to live in. I would say Italy. Uh, because I really like the attitude and uh, the people and they are similar to Greek. So the olive oil isn't too bad too? So. What? The olive oil isn't that, that bad too? Yeah, it's, it's like olive oil and, uh, you know. <laughs> or maybe Spain. I, you know, I've never tried these cities, uh, like these countries, for living there. Uh, I'm mostly, I've lived in Berlin and in Krakow, which is not close to my culture and like my country. So I would like also to try to live somewhere in like South. Uh, but also I'm having some plans for, again, later in the future, uh, for going like on the side of Africa. But uh, we'll see about it also. Okay, great. And uh, favorite musician? Definitely Arctic Monkeys. Really? <laughs> Without second thought, definitely Arctic Monkeys, Alex Turner. And your, and your favorite music for them? My favorite song? Yeah, song, sorry, yeah. Um, I would say Are You Mine? Because it's like a song I'm totally stuck with it for years now. And I don't know why, but I'm never getting bored of this song. It's like, I, I maybe I'm not listening to it when I'm sitting home or listening to music, but when I'm listening to this song, on a pub outside, I'm just starting jumping up and down and head bugging and I'm like, you know, hell yeah, like Arctic Monkeys. So I guess it's my favorite song from them. Okay. And second one, I would say Planet of Zeus, which is a Greek band, Greek stoner rock band. Perfect music. I love them as well. So these two, yeah. Okay, and favorite song to sing and play? Favorite song to sing and play? That's a tough one. Um, okay, I would say from English songs. Um, from English songs, I would say Billie Jean. 
uh, from originally from Michael Jackson, but I like the um, cover of Chris Cornell from Audio Slave. Uh, he changed it totally and he made it amazing. And it's a song that I really, it, it's like, it's really fitting my voice and I really like to sing this song. So I will say, yeah, uh, Billie Jean from Chris Cornell from Audio Slave. Okay, in uh, Ricky Morty or Bojack Rossman? Rossman. Oh, <laughs> that's a tough. One. That's the toughest one, basically. Um, so, I I cannot really choose. Really, I I, I don't know because that's it's right like uh, Bojack Horseman is actually I can ad- identify myself with Bojack Horseman because of the artistic part of himself and also this kind of um, you know edgy behavior let's say uh, which is like it reminds myself when i'm for example uh like in a bad situation or i'm drunk or something like that you know it is kind of not able to control yourself which is not something that i have for example it's not that i don't have self-control or something but it reminds me of stages of my life that I've been in really worse, like, you know, and uh, just being like Bojack and drinking and doing nothing. And uh, just focus on wanna be artist and musician without doing actually something proper. And it kind of reminds me of that situations. On the other hand, Rick and Morty is like uh, the scientific part of me about sciences and um, like uh, I, I like this kind of uh, simplified physics and chemistry and um, astrophysics and parallel, parallel universes and uh, aliens and possibilities. And I'm watching the kind of uh, rationalistic um, uh, YouTube channels, I say, and it's the other part of myself. But um, I will say Rick and Morty. I will end up with Rick and Morty. Uh, because it's like, the reason is that um, I can see myself more in Rick as a future grandpa, <laughs> being, you know, totally uh, focused on my stuff and uh, just grabbing my grandchild and start talking to him about science and, you know, societies and stuff like that. So because of the nerd, the nerd part of Rick is actually something that I probably going to do with my I don't know, children or grandchildren, if I ever have, who knows. Okay, let's just hope you don't turn yourself into a vehicle. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> and a uh, favorite dish? Favorite dish? Um, I would say... Spetsofai, which is a Greek dish with sausages and peppers and uh, tomato sauce. It's super tasty. I just love it. Uh, but it's like something homemade, you know, it's like home food. And of course, from like fast food, I would say gyros, shuvlaki. Yeah. Which is like pita bread with jajiki and the gyros and everything inside. Uh, so, oh, I missed it so much. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> and last question. I'm going to go an easy one for you. Favorite roommate to go to karaoke? Bruno. Of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Matthew Mateos, the man with many names and much more talents. Thank that you is for, of mine. For, <laughs> thank you for participating in this interview. Is there <laughs> something you would like to plug in? Feel free. To do what? To plug in something that you would like to tell us to follow. Um, I have my YouTube channel, Matthew A. Hadjis. A stands for Antonio, which is my father's name. So Matthew A. Hadjis. Um, you gonna find the description probably down like on the the link below as youtubers say and uh, i'm probably upload i'm just uploading covers and i have two songs of mine from like in greek so if you want to listen greek how greek music it sounds just i mean good greek music not the mainstream one yeah so my youtube channel i would say that's the thing i care most i guess okay great and uh he's uh stuff to do is on uh, this youtube channel so it's easier for you just click on the logo and you're there well thanks again matthew it was a great interview thank you very much Bruno. <laughs>
Bye.